afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to ICD-10 for Clinical Staff, Part 2, Documentation Improvement. As we begin, I'd like to offer a special thank you to the State Office of Rural Health and Ms. Patsy Whaley for making this webinar series possible in connection with the Small Rural Hospital Improvement Program, also known as the SHIP Grant. This is the final of four requested sessions designed to assist your organization in preparing for ICD-10 implementation. With all the buzz surrounding the ICD-10 and how much greater the specificity requirements are, we are brought back to the question providers have been asking for years, what do you want me to say? Exactly what do providers need to establish in the medical record to comply with the requirements of this new code set? And really, why does it matter? To address these and other concerns, we bring to you Paula Digby, a principal with AQ Consulting of Dallas, Georgia. Paula works with healthcare organizations and physician practices to identify and rectify revenue capture and process issues which have the potential to paralyze the organization. She also directs chart to bill audits on behalf of those organizations. She has broad experience across multi-physician practice specialties in supervision, management, reimbursement, and coding. Paula works on various Department of Justice files as an expert coding resource. Ms. Digby is certified through AHIMA as a Certified Coding Specialist, CCS, and through AAPC as a Certified Professional Coder, CPC, a Certified Coding Instructor, CPCI, and is an AHIMA-approved ICD-10-CM PCS instructor. This session is being recorded and will be available in a few days for playback at the State Office of Rural Health website. Many of you have brought your HIM staff along for this session, and we are able to offer AHIMA CEU credit for successfully completing the evaluation and test at the end of this presentation. We do ask that you complete this even if you are not interested in the AHIMA CEU. This evaluation helps the SHIP coordinator to determine the effectiveness of this program. The test will show in your browser when you have completed the session evaluation. One last thing before we begin. Today we ask a polling question regarding all the sessions that we've had. So if you would please select all that apply. Have you implemented as a result of these sessions any of the following? Have you identified a transition team or created an action plan? Have you performed transition awareness training for key staff? Have you amended query forms or other clinical documentation tools? Have you created a budget for the transition? Or have you done any of the other measures that have been suggested? Thank you for making those selections. Your responses are very important to the process of online education. Now we will turn our attention to our topic and to Ms. Digby. Paula? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our fourth in our series on ICD-10. Today's topic is ICD-10 for clinical staff, and so we're really focusing on the documentation requirements for ICD-10. As a clinician, you've likely uttered this phrase to your coding staff, why do they cringe? Just tell me what to say. This session will provide insight for a meeting of the minds, if you will between the clinical staff and the coding staff in your organization. Often, physicians ask directly for a statement to be provided which he or she will review and sign. Perhaps your work life would be a lot less stressful with this notion in place, but I assure you those tasked with coding your diagnoses and procedures would not be happy with those orange jumpsuits provided to prison inmates. If you're being pursued with pesky queries today or if you feel like you're constantly pursuing your physician counterparts and you're beginning to feel frustrated by the thought of just how much more will be required of you when ICD-10 is implemented, is there a way to get your entire team on the same page and eliminate some of this hassle? What if your physicians do not really care about reimbursement, but only want to take care of the patients, which we hear many of them say? Must they be concerned with something as trivial as a word or a phrase when the life of the patient is more important? First, may I say thanks for asking these vital questions. For being willing to ask, I applaud you. 
during today's session, I'll answer these questions and provide a detailed discussion of documentation improvement focus and techniques that will be needed under IC10. Of course, there is no reason to delay, so we're just going to move forward. Small tweaks today may lead forward to much better outcomes as we move towards the implementation, and that's regardless of when that implementation actually takes place. While the majority of the presentation is prepared for the clinical staff and the clinical documentation and those who assist, such as the clinical documentation improvement specialist, portions are for the coding staff as well, and I think that both backgrounds of you will get information out of today's session. New concepts are much more smoothly implemented, as we know, when everyone on the boat is rowing in the same direction. Don't you agree? The question you may be asking yourself, or you may have asked yourself when you decided to sign up for today's presentation is, why should I listen to this presentation? I know I ask myself that question as I go and attend different educational events. One of the things that we have struggled with over the years is, getting physicians to say the appropriate things in the medical record. And we know that we've been on ICD-9 for quite a long period of time, and we are still having issues today trying to get them to say the most appropriate things and get to the greatest degree of specificity. We also know that ICD-10 is that much more specified. There is more specificity in ICD-10. We're increasing the number of codes fivefold. So therefore, then we're all looking to say, OK, what now needs to happen in our documentation? Just how much more do we have to say in the medical record when IC-10 is implemented? Many physicians, when I'm talking IC-10, ask this question. They already say now, just tell me what to say and how much more I, do I need to write volumes, you know? And the answer is no, you don't need to write volumes. The answer is truly in the quality of the documentation rather than the quantity of the documentation. Today we'll answer some of the questions and give you some food for thought as we move forward to IC10 related to some of the key documentation requirements to achieve the most optimal code assignment, data collection, and of course reimbursement. Throughout this session, we're going to identify some of the hot button diagnoses where we often see improvement as necessary. And then we're going to discuss some of the nuances specific to IC10. We'll wrap up with some ideas on how to elicit more clear documentation from your physician staff. And actually, rather than wrapping up with that, we'll probably discuss it going through as we indicate those different diagnoses. If any of the physicians on the line, have any of you ever made these statements? All of this reimbursement talk makes me ill. Tell me what you just want to hear. You are keeping me from the important work of helping the patient. I am being specific. Just tell me what to say. Or if you're a nurse or a coding documentation specialist, I know you've heard these statements at least once in your life. Let me assure those physicians documenters on the line, you are not wearing a bullseye. We are not trying to chase you down. Everyone will be affected by this transition to IC10. And again, we want your documentation to improve. So what we are going to do and what I'm going to suggest we do is to implement queries currently in today's environment and implement other things to educate our physician staff on what is needed going forward under IC10. It's not that we have to identify that we're changing and documenting for IC10, we're documenting for accuracy. So those of you who are on the line who are not physician documenters and who are, who are working with your physicians to get the most appropriate documentation. Let's just teach them what we need for documentation. It's really irrelevant whether we're talking about I-9 or I-10, although I-10 is more specific in the codes assigned. If we get the documentation as specific as needed, then the coding system that we use really doesn't matter because we'll be able to assign those codes based on the existing documentation. The healthcare industry basically is being squeezed economically, as is the rest of our country. For the most part, all payers are interested in paying less. 
on the other hand, it seems like our providers are interested in providing better, more effective, more efficient, more pleasant outcomes for the patient, which usually cost more. Can a balance be achieved? For a moment, let's turn our attention to the elephant in the room. Without this elephant, our hospitals wouldn't be able to maintain or purchase equipment, hire staff, or even keep the electricity turned on. Without it, the physician couldn't provide for his or her family. The elephant, as we know, is reimbursement. Like it or not, reimbursement is important. Until you and I become independently wealthy and can provide free medical care, the system will stand or collapse under the weight of this elephant. Yes, of course, the work of helping the patient is the most important. And unlike physicians in the last several decades, we're held to a higher standard of documentation. You may recognize that several years back, if you're specifically a clinical documentation improvement person or a coder, looking at coding clinic guidelines, they've directed specificity for years. Back in the 1980s and, and before, we were asking physicians to get more specificity in the record. But because our code structure wasn't that much more specific, we could get away with some less specific documentation. It's a fact of life. Your documentation must be accurate, must be as specific as possible in today's world. It must be legible, and it must be signed. So entities such as health grades, for instance, will provide stats based on physician practices and on physician and provider services publicly that show how you deal with your patients. That information from health grades is based solely on the documentation you provide in the medical record. And then that information is coded and that data is collected. And so, for instance, your patients, it may look like you treat a very low acuity patient because the severity of illness or the specificity isn't documented clearly on, on particular patients. And then the comparison is done to the outcomes with other patients with that same specificity, and it makes that provider or that physician look like they don't provide as, as much of a quality of care. And this information is publicly available on the Internet, and so our mothers and fathers who are out there having their children look on sites like Health Grades for information related to the physician may give that, give that physician or that hospital a lower rating based on the documentation issues when in fact the physician may be a very good physician. It's just not the documentation and the specificity documented didn't define that clearly and so it, it made the physician look like he didn't provide his quality of care and then of course we may lose patients in the process. So it's very important to get that documentation and to get the quality of documentation. And no, you do not have to write volumes, not really. While more specific documentation will be needed really under IC10, the focus for clinical documentation improvement should lie in the quality of the details, not the quantity, as I've already indicated. That's why it's important to identify your IC10 documentation gaps. And you need to do that now. Determine pragmatic tactics to capture the desired specificity needed and prioritize your documentation improvement efforts. So that's like a, a, the rules of the road and where to go for after today's session. But to start with, we're going to look at some of the areas that will become more specific and some differentiation that we see between I-9 and I-10 when we're talking about documentation requirements. Now there is some good news. Although IC-10 contains approximately five times the number of codes as IC-9, your documentation does not, as I said, need to be five times more detailed. In fact, many of the strengthened codes actually explain details that we are already getting in the record, such as laterality, what side of the body things are occurring on, or what limb things occur with for injuries and, and diseases. A drastic number of codes have been created to address laterality. Left and right are commonly already, as I've said, included in the record. 
today if your physicians are not already addressing laterality in the documentation, you should assist them uh, or begin the query process to get that in the record. Now this is one very small step that will lead to smoother sailing in the future. But now from the laterality perspective, and I've, I've said this uh, at a session uh, earlier this month, that is one of those places that we as coders and clinical documentation improvement specialists are not typically focusing because physicians are typically getting it in the record. So we already feel like we have a win in that situation. And, and I think we will feel the same under ICD-10. If you joined us on the last call, you may have already seen this information, but I wanted to go through the next few slides just giving you some basics and some changes in IC10 so that we can set the stage for how to document those situations. There were combination codes for conditions and common symptoms or manifestations added in IC10. Some combination codes were created differently than the way they are reported in IC9, such as type 1 diabetes mellitus with diabetic neuropathy requires one code. In IC9, it required two. So we did have one code to describe this, but we needed the second for the diabetic neuropathy in IC9, where in ICD-10, it will be reported as one global code. Also, there are combination codes added for poisoning and external causes. So you see an example here of poisoning by penicillins, accidental, unintentional, subsequent encounter. And you might already notice that there's more information described in that particular code. So then, of course, from the clinical documentation perspective, we're going to be looking for things like, what encounter is this? Was it intentional use? Was it unintentional use? How was this patient taking this medication? And so that we can code it appropriately. This, as I've already indicated also, there's added laterality. So you see an example here of malignant neoplasm of the lower outer quadrant of the right female breast. So of course, in this case, one of the things that we would need to recognize and be documented was what the location is, but also is it male or female, so that that can be coded appropriately. Also, there are seventh character extensions added for episodes of care in certain situations, such as concussion with loss of consciousness of 30 minutes or less, initial encounter, and you also saw that on the combination code example. The seventh character extension we just spoke about, and I have it on this slide here for you to see, and there's another example for you as well, the age-related osteoporosis with current pathological fracture, right femur, initial encounter for fracture. So again, all of this information needs to be documented in the record. Continuing with expanded codes for injuries, such as alcohol and substance abuse, caused injuries. You see an example of cocaine dependence with intoxication delirium. And there are new codes for the inclusion of the trimester in the obstetric codes. We now need to know what trimester or the number of weeks that a patient is pregnant. So for example, you see that case, pre-existing essential hypertension complicating pregnancy second trimester. And then under timelines had changes related to the MI. Your MIs are now, the period has changed from eight weeks to four weeks for your acute MI. And abortion versus fetal death, that time period has changed from 20 to 22 weeks. And the reason I bring these issues up is because that means we want to get documentation in the chart of, say for instance, the number of weeks along uh, when a fetal death occurs or the period of time frame from when the MI is treated. Now let's talk about some of the specifics of some of the most common diagnoses. And, and you'll notice that we have issues with the documentation of these diagnoses under I-9. In addition to, we'll need some either greater specificity in ICT-10. Again, I don't want to make this seem like it's too difficult and it's, it's not doable because you will see a lot of commonality between what we're doing in IC9 and the rules and the coding for IC10. I think if you joined us on, on the last call, then you saw that as well. 
for ICD-10, the specificity required includes relationships between the disease and treatment and between the disease and symptoms and or complications. This is, again, not different from ICD-9 combination coding, although at times it can be uh, for certain diseases. We have been asking for this type of specificity for years and still have issues getting the necessary information, so starting now just makes sense. I've said this previously, but one way to change behaviors now uh, for what is coming is to look at your queries and amend them to IC10 specificity requirements. A few slides back, we talked about performing a gap analysis. I would run a list of my top 10, top 20, or start with the top 10, and then move to the top 20 diagnoses and look at what the needed specificity is under ICD-10, and then look at the documentation that your physicians are routinely providing and see how they're measuring up. See are they measuring up to get the specificity in that record that's needed, and if they're not, build queries around that variance so that you can begin to get this information in the record, and there you go, you've already started a training process and the more we move closer to IC10 implementation, the better your documentation is going to line up. And of course, the better the data collection, and then also the lower opportunities for reduced reimbursement. The first example I want to talk about is diabetes. Diabetes is going from 59 codes to over 200 codes. And the specificity needed, although has some familiarity, there are newly added diagnoses that must be associated in the documentation for clear reporting. First of all, the physician should state the type of diabetes, and if the condition is due to another diagnosis or event, such as medication, malnutrition, post-procedural event, or neoplasms. And this is not an exhaustive list, this is just examples. Now, following, the physician should also, and this is the hard part, document other conditions as associated with that diabetes when they exist. In IC10, there's new specificity in this area. For our patients with associated diabetes manifestations, some of the options for code assignment are familiar, we're familiar with and others were added. For example, we now expect clarification regarding associated chronic kidney disease, versus other nephropathies, such as uh, glomerulosclerosis or glomerulonephrosis, and that's a hard one to say, uh, but we want the physician to give us the specificity of the nephrology. Is it a true chronic kidney disease that's associated with that diabetes, or is it another nephrological condition? In the case of peripheral angiopathy, there is one code to describe the patient as with gangrene versus a patient without gangrene. And also, as we're doing today, if our physician documents the patient with diabetes, PVD, and gangrene, the coder is then going to ask, is there an association between these conditions? Because it's coded as though they are not associated if the physician doesn't document them as associated. However, as far as neurological manifestations, there's further information is needed than was required in I-9. The question will be asked if the physician says neurological manifestation, is it an autonomic manifestation such as gastroparesis, is it a neuralgia, is it amophytry, is it mononeuropathy, is it polyneuropathy, all of these are coded differently, so of course specificity will be required in the documentation. Basically, just to restate it a different way, ICD-10 diabetes codes are combination codes, and documentation at a minimum should include the type of the diabetes, the body system affected, the complications affecting the body system, a clear link should be drawn between documenting these aspects of the codes. The use of insulin should also be documented in the medical record, and a link should be drawn between the insulin use and the diabetes. As far as secondary diabetes, it should be clearly linked to the underlying disorder that is causing that secondary diabetes.
Moving on to cerebral infarctions, there are combination codes for common etiologies and manifestations such as cerebral infarction due to thrombosis of left vertebral artery. Do you see how specific that was? That particular IC10 code indicates what caused the cerebral infarction and the artery impacted. In addition to that, coders are instructed to code additionally if it is applicable the use of administration of, of TPA in a different facility within the last 24 hours prior to the admission of the current facility. So that also should be documented for cerebral infarctions. Cerebral infarctions include occlusions and stenosis of the cerebral and precerebral arteries, of course, resulting in that infarction. The physicians should be directed to state what the infarction is due to. Is it due to an embolism, an occlusion, stenosis, thrombosis, and to specify which artery was impacted because each, whatever the cause is, that goes to a different specific code. In addition, the episode of care is important and any associated sequela uh, should be documented and of course associated with the infarction if relevant, such as hemiplegia due to cerebral infarction. And for the hemiplegia, you want to indicate whether it was the dominant side or the non-dominant side, or if you simply indicate whether the patient is right-handed or left-handed, then the coder can, can determine based on that, whether the hemiplegia was on the dominant side or the non-dominant side. And hemiplegia is not the only, that's just an example. There are dysphagia and aphasia and several other diagnoses, apraxia, ataxia, that if the physician doesn't indicate they are a sequela of another condition, then they are coded more as an idiopathic condition rather than due to that particular condition. While we're on the topic of association of conditions, I wanted to bring out this coding guideline that is documented in the ISD-10 guidelines. And it's specifically related to complications of care. And it says code assignment is based on the provider's documentation of the relationship between the condition and the care or procedure. The guideline extends to any complication of care regardless of the chapter the code is located in. It's important to note that all, not all conditions that occur during or following medical care or surgery are classified as complications. There must be a cause and effect relationship between the care provided and the condition and an indication in the documentation that it is a complication. Query the provider if a complication is not clearly documented. So again, that's another place that we're going to ask the physician, and, and we do, that's consistent with today's environment. We want to know when things have a causal relationship, when they're a manifestation, when they're a sequela, and that all needs to be indicated specifically in the medical record. I want to talk about specificity. ICD-10 also requires in some situations the episode of care for injuries and certain illnesses such as fractures. ICD-10 relies more heavily on the episode of care in describing cares for injuries and illnesses. Although this is often already documented in the medical record, moving forward it becomes required data. For example, fracture codes have an expectation to recognize the type of encounter as the initial encounter for a fracture, subsequent encounter for a fracture with routine healing, or subsequent encounter for a fracture with delayed healing, or sequela of a fracture. So then we have the ability to identify what, how we're treating that fracture and what the episode of care is. Again, that's going to require greater specificity on that episode of care because physicians aren't always saying that now, whether it was an initial or subsequent. If you are in a physician office, you likely will know this information sometimes a lot more readily than we know it in the hospital as well. Sometimes you know it clearly in the hospital. Other things, greater specificity in IC10 in identifying diseases and conditions such as comas, 
coders are instructed that when a coma occurs, they also should code first any, any injury such as a fracture of the skull or an intracranial injury. There is a seventh digit required, or seventh character, I should say, required for comas as well to give time frames. As far as an unspecified time frame, if it happened in the field, at the arrival of the emergency department, at admission to the hospital, 24 hours or more after the hospital admission. So the timing of that coma is, is really important. Now, of course, documentation will need to reflect the exact diagnosis to take advantage of the improved code set in ICD-10. It's also more specific regarding the anatomical location, and that documentation will need to clearly specify the anatomical location, such as instead of just saying pain in the limb, we need what limb, what side of the limb is on, and what part of the limb is in, impacted. You know, that's very important. Another thing to mention off the cuff here a little bit, and I, I did make a slide for you, is with the comas, one of the things that we are not required to code now that we will look for under IC10 is the Glasgow Coma score Scale. Now, this is just some examples. I just took a picture out of the IC10 manual so that you could see how we need to code based on the Glasgow Coma score scale, and you could see basically these things need to be documented in the record. The physician in testing this patient and seeing what level of coma that they're in, how they lay out on the scale based on their responses or lack of responses, and we would code that now. So that's one of those things that maybe you can start today then beginning educating your physicians to document in the record and so that we can pull that out, that information out. Moving on to documentation of injuries for ICD-10, I mean, it also features an expanded category. A seventh character extension identifies the type of the encounter, as we've already indicated. An A was that you might have recognized from a few slides back was for initial encounter, and D was for subsequent encounter. And we also indicate if it's a fracture per se, whether it's sequela of the fracture, whether it's a delayed healing or a normal healing. Coding professionals are also going to code the size and depth of an injury under ICD-10, which again should be captured in the documentation. Here's what we need to look for. The cause of the injury should be documented. The exact anatomical site should be documented. In the cases of fractures, of course, we need to know the fracture type, whether it's green stick, traverse, oblique, spiral, comminuted, segmental, specific anatomical site, whether the fracture is displaced or not, laterality, which arm, which leg, which side of the body, routine versus delayed healing, non-unions and malunions also need to be indicated. And when we're talking about burns, they should include documentation of the exact anatomical location of the burn, the laterality, we're adding laterality to that, type and the agent of the burn, what caused the burn, the degree of burn, and of course the type of encounter, just like we are doing for fractures. That's very important, and those are things that you now need to begin to ask your physicians about. In the table of drugs and chemicals, we have a new classification for underdosing. I've got a piece of the table of drugs and chemicals here for you so that you can get a, a good idea of, of what we're asking for and why we're asking for these specific documentation requirements. Underdosing identifies situations in which a patient has taken less of a medication than prescribed by the physician. The medical condition is sequenced first with the underdosing code listed as a secondary diagnosis. So you see IC10 for the coders on the line, there are still going to be situations where we're going to assign two codes to describe the situation. The intent is either noncompliance or a complication of care, if known, should be documented. Now that's added to the way that we're already reporting, and this is just a cutout of a piece of the IC10 table of drugs and chemicals for 2012. This is the 2012 manual picture, actually. You'll see here that the columns are poisoning or accidental, meaning unintentional, poisoning intentional because there was a self-harm, poisoning assault, poisoning undetermined, poisoning adverse effect, or underdosing. So that's just an added thing we need to know when we're talking about poisonings.
For acute myocardial infarctions, the age definition of an AMI has changed to four weeks rather than eight weeks. In our current environment, we're eight weeks, but therefore the documentation should support the new age definition. So we need to know when a patient is seen for an acute MI, how long it's been since they had that acute MI, what time frame are we in. And this is not different, it's just that that time frame has changed for coding an acute MI. There's different terminology used and of course laterality is included. Laterality as well as the site, the coronary artery involved should be documented in the medical record. And AMI should be documented as non-transmural or subendocardial. Should also include the site. This just allows for more specific coding. The encounter type, again, whether it's initial or a subsequent encounter, should also be documented. Now, that's not much changed as far as that encounter type under what we're doing currently in ICD-9. And it's not much change from my experience going around the country and looking at medical records. Physicians are not typically telling you the encounter as initial or subsequent. If we can determine that by other record documentation, we do, but oftentimes it's not stated. Just to give you, and I know this is really, really small on the slide, I again cut out a piece of the I-10 book because I wanted you to see. You'll see here it's in a indented fashion and the dashes at the front show how far indented it is. So the first main term is myocardium and then you see, and it was uh, infarction, myocardium, and you see an indention is diagnosed on ECG but presenting no symptoms, so that would be one code. And you notice the very next one for healed or old is the same code. Uh, versus one that, that was intraoperative and you've got a code for whether it happened during a cardiac surgery or during an other surgery. Also you have non-Q wave or non-ST elevation, so you see those and those are actually the same code. And then you have for subsequent, subsequent is going to be a, a different code. Then non-transmural and then it goes on to describe the non-transmurals, the location of them. So we need to know the location uh, as well as the type of MI, as well as the duration or the timing of the MI. So that was just to give you a picture of what is required, not that you would need to, if you're not a coder on the line today, need to understand all the different codes, but again, just to give you a good indication of what we're going to need for documentation. For neoplasms, the documentation should include, as always, the behavior such as benign, in situ, malignant, or uncertain histological behavior. And also some malignancies will require the documentation of stage and depth, as well as the site of the malignancy should be documented. And we've had, a, it's not a category, but a new code added for contiguous sites within the different sections of ICD-10 showing the malignancies, and I'll show you that in just a second. If the malignancy has a secondary site, of course, that should be documented, or if you are, if the physician is working on the secondary site, of course, we want to know the primary site and where that malignancy has come from. When applicable, the histological type should also be documented, and of course, laterality for paired organs or extremities. And I indicated this earlier, when there are neoplasms on the breast, the sex of the patient should also be indicated, whether it's male or female. This is just an example of the depth of a malignancy, because this is for a malignant neoplasm on the tongue. And you see how it goes into more detail, whether it's the dorsal surface of the tongue, the border of the tongue, the ventral surface, the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, lingual tonsil, or you have overlapping contiguous sites, so there's a separate code for that. And you can just go down into the degree of the cancer on the tongue and the location. This is a picture, again, I just wanted you to reference it, a picture of a portion of the neoplasm table in IC10. So, for example, in this case, if our patient had uh, cancer in the abdomen, and that's all we knew, and it was a malignant primary cancer, then, of course, we're going to code from that first column, and it would be C76.2, and then we revert back to the tabular and see how much further we need to carry that code, if any, as well as you would just do the same for the different columns from the different types of cancer. From the pregnancy and dealing with pregnant females, 
the documentation of the trimester is now required. The trimester is counted from the first day of the last menstrual period. So what we need documented is the number of weeks that a person is pregnant. That is the most important thing for us as far as coding for pregnancy related. The episode of care has been deleted, so although it's nice to have that documented now, it's not a requirement. And then also, when we are coding for obstructed labor, we now need to incorporate the reason for that obstruction. And we've got code extensions to identify the number of the fetus, one to five, affected by that obstetric condition. These should be validated. So when you have multiple deliveries or multiple pregnancies, if one fetus is affected and another is not, we need that documented in the record so that it could be coded appropriately. So just remember the weeks needs to be documented for those pregnant patients. It's imperative that the most specific codes be reported to provide the most accurate ability to provide meaningful data on patient care and severity. Now we've established that. We established that at the beginning of today, but I wanted to read to you something that CMS had published related to IC10 on their website. It says, uh, while the increased specificity of documentation in IC10 will change the way clinical encounters are currently documented, it will ultimately promote improvements to patient care. Greater detail in clinical documentation drives more effective and efficient patient care by providing higher quality data. The quality of patient care is enhanced by the greater detail in documentation as it lends valuable insight and collaborative support to other practitioners the patient may encounter. The more precise, higher quality data also promotes improved quality reporting, improved clinical decision support, and increased patient safety. The improved documentation required by IC10 can also result in faster and fuller reimbursement. Now we're okay with that one, right? When coders no longer have to spend time trying to interpret vague documentation or going back to the physician with questions, providers will get paid faster. And that's straight from CMS. That's a good thing when we get our documentation as clear and specific as possible to improve documentation and get our payments faster. But now on the flip side of that, we also have situations which I fully expect, and it may not happen the first few years uh, with it, of implementation with I-10, but going forward I expect it because, you know, we're providing higher quality care. We've got to get more clear in our specificity of our diagnoses. If we have physicians or providers who are non-compliant and continue to document with a lack of specificity, my expectation is the reimbursement will be impacted because there might be coverage issues where if we indicated that a disease or illness and we gave the specificity of that disease or illness versus just saying it was unspecified, it may be covered for that specific diagnosis, but it may not be covered for that non-specific diagnosis. So that's fully where I see this going, and this is just a, a guess on my part, but I, I fully see it going there because we are moving to get paid for the quality of care we provide, and the only way to prove that quality of care is based on the diagnoses of the patient really and that patient's severity of illness and, and how that patient was treated and, and looking at, at outcomes. So uh, very important. This slide indicates that current documentation practices should be assessed and a plan developed to improve health, the health record documentation, thereby minimizing the use of vague and nonspecific codes. As I indicated early on, we really should perform those gap analysis now. I think that in the few diagnoses that we've had time to talk about today, and, and I picked out some of the ones that are most common that I wanted us to talk about, you've seen how things need to be a little more specific. We need to tweak that documentation just a little bit. And if we don't do that going forward, again, I think it's going to impact not only the data, but our reimbursement. If you start now, and as I suggested earlier, perform that gap analysis, then you can see where your hot buttons are and where you need to work. To do that, I'm not sure if, if all of you know, but the information that I got, the uh, coding manuals that I got, you don't have to go out and buy an IC10 manual. You can download it off the CMS website. 
you can download that manual right off the CMS website. In addition to many of you in hospitals and facilities, you get with your HIM department. Their encoder resources have already begun to add IC10 to their resources. And so you could go in and pull up code ranges very quickly and determine what is needed for documentation to then build queries and elicit physicians, talk to them about what needs to change and put out newsletters. There's another idea. Put out newsletters and have a documentation minute. Don't call it IC10. They're going to get really tired of hearing IC10 this <laughs> between now and, and a year or two years from now. It's documentation. It's simply quality documentation and that's what we need to get in the record. This is just another slide to say provide that gap analysis and then go forward and make changes. Look at trends. That was the thing I didn't say. Look at trends. Look at procedures, specific procedures and diagnoses and use that as a tool to guide where your documentation needs to change. The bottom line. IC10 will challenge our clinical documentation. It's going to demand much greater level of specificity than is currently required, as I'm sure you saw through some of the slides. And we're working to ensure clinical documentation accuracy and improvement should be a major focus in your move towards IC10 preparation. It should be a major focus right now. I know AHIMA states that and supports that, as do, as do I and, and we at AQIQ. We do not believe, I mean, look at the number of years we've had struggles trying to get the documentation for I-9. I feel sure we're going to have similar issues in I-10, but if we start now, that just lightens the load a little bit, so to speak. And I think that you should address physicians in several avenues. You should address them in newsletters. You should address, you hand out little cards when they come to the HIM department. Or if you're a CDI specialist, say, hey, doc, today's card is acute renal failure. We want to talk about what you need to document for it and hand it to them. And just keep working it. You can't just tell them one time and walk away. You've got to tell them, tell them what you told them, and tell them again, and, and tell them again. <laughs> Now remember, our old rule is if it wasn't documented, it wasn't done, this is going to become more important under IC10. If documentation is accurate, we may see greater reimbursement and we will absolutely paint a better picture of our patient's severity of illness. The vast effects of IC10 implementation have made it most important for health entities to get their entire teams into the same boat. Breaking down those communication barriers that have threatened to sink our ships, if you will. It's now all hands on deck, so to speak. The clinical staff, like the captain of the ship, our physician, has a great responsibility with the coding and billing staff, as well as the task with assisting our physicians, such as our clinical documentation improvement staff. We will continue to need more and more details in the record. It's very, very important to get on top, stay on top, and move forward. And I think I reiterated that and said it two or three times, so I guess you can tell that's my soapbox area, right? Just a few ideas, really, on top of what we've already discussed. Review your documentation. Change your queries now. So this is really just a restatement of what I said earlier. The clinical documentation improvement guys, you, you know, you've kind of got your hands full, and I think you know that because you have had for a lot of time, even though you're, you're kind of a new group, so to speak, but you have a very, very important role because now more than ever, we've got some clinical documentation folks are coders and some are clinical staff. Some hospitals have out their coders as separate entities from their CDI, and some have them as a combined entity. And in either case, if they're separate entities, having that liaison between the physician and the coder and, and getting that documentation appropriate now for I-10 and the specificity needed is going to be key. And this is just a restatement of some of the specific documentation areas that I think are going to be huge. And if we, again, address them now, laterality, the stages of healing, and we're seeing that now. We're seeing that now. The stages of healing, so you're talking about skin conditions, that continues under IC10. The episode of care is a new thing that we're going to see in more categories of IC10. And then, of course, the trimester or the weeks of pregnancy that need to be indicated. So basically, the greater specificity 
it's not going to be will be required, it is required. It is required now, and that's, that's why we have you wonderful CDI folks in our facilities. Now, as we wrap up, I'm not going to go through these all specifically, but this is basically what I based my main diagnoses on that I wanted to cover with you all today because from AHEMA, these are our top clinical documentation problem areas across the country. And so I just addressed a few of them. And if you recall diabetes, you know, there are many more going from 59 to over 200 codes. There are many more opportunities and the specificity of whether it's not just a neurological condition with, associated with the diabetes, it's what type of neurological condition, or it's not just a nephrology or a kidney condition, it's what kidney condition associated with that diabetes, as well as some other areas as well. To wrap it all up and to show you on one slide, these are the, and I would be surprised if, if a lot of these are not in your top 10 list or your top 20 list in your hospitals and physician offices for the diagnoses that you see as most often. Now, if you were with us on the last call, I started a story, and just to end up on a light note, I started a story about Snow White, and we coded out a scenario of Snow White eating the poisoned apple and, and what happened in that case, and I, and I told you just to stay tuned and see what would happen with Prince Charming. Now, this was special thanks to Sherry Glass with the Texas Coding Roundtable Committee. It was just really cute, so I wanted to share it with you. Our prince, while riding to save Snow White, falls off his horse in the forest and sustains a comminuted open fracture of the shaft of the left femur, documented by the physician and described as highly contaminated with a 10-centimeter laceration. The way that we're going to code this encounter then is going to be a displaced comminuted fracture of the shaft of the left femur initial encounter with the type of the fracture, type 3A, 3B, or 3C. So again, you see how specific that code is, and that just drives home the need for that very clear clinical documentation. Also, Prince Charming was an animal rider injured by fall from or being thrown from a horse in a non-collision accident, and this was also his initial encounter. And the forest was the place of occurrence, and the activity, of course, was horseback riding. So I guess, I guess those of you who are CDI folks who've never dealt in depth with diagnosis codes, the ICD-9 codes, ICD-9 is very similar, and we can code every condition and how it happened. But ICD-10, again, just gets that much more specific related, uh, in this case, to the uh, type of encounter, the type of fracture. We've all, always been able to describe how an, an encounter happened. So thank you for that today, guys. Pam, I'll turn it back to you, and we can open up the lines for any questions. Hey, Pam, this is Paula. I, I can't hear you. So one thing I wanted to say and follow up to today's session is we will be creating more specific information and web events related to specific diagnoses where we can focus an amount of time to individual diagnoses and what needs to be documented. There certainly isn't time in one hour to go through the entire ICD-10 manual and, and look at all of our top issues and the depth that we need to get to going forward. So at any rate, Pam, are, are you there? I think I hear you. Yes, thank you. I'm so sorry. Apparently uh, there was a glitch where I'm talking. We appreciate all of your work in bringing us this clarification here, and I do have a couple of questions in the queue. So let me start by asking, how long should a facility access both code sets during the transition to facilitate disease tracking and medical necessity edits? I did hear the question, so I hope everyone else did. I'll repeat it. How long should a facility or a, a practice be able to utilize is what it sounded like, both ICD-9 and ICD-10. The recommendation right now is six months to a year. Until we really get into it, my expectation is probably six months to a year will be fine, but there's probably going to be those situations where, for instance, racks can go back three years. So you need to have someone available and still understanding the ICD-9 code structure when you're dealing with those claims that are under review three years back. In addition, through my other work with government entities and review organizations as well as attorneys, you may have investigations going back more than that. I think the longest I've seen it go back is 10 years. Of course, we don't need to be actively, I don't think, able to utilize I-9 for that long, 
but it's helpful to have someone on staff who was there back in the day at that point and could understand it, I would think. Okay. Well, I do have another one that's come in. Um, what impact will this, and I think by this it means the transition, what impact will this have on our reimbursement time? Well, that's an excellent question. As I indicated in the presentation, I think there absolutely will be some impacts on reimbursement, but I really think it's anybody's call right now because it depends on how well that everyone, including those in the payer sector as well as those of us in the provider world, are able to transition appropriately. Of course, any time change occurs, and this is such a huge change, we're going to expect some slowdown on that reimbursement process or some glitches. So I don't really know that I could say right now what the duration would be or if we could expect to slow down and not get reimbursement for an amount of time, but I would just say because it is a risk, your facilities and providers should be preparing now, and we've been preaching this for a number of years from the financial perspective, so you have some money in the bank, so to speak, so that if payments were you know, slowed, it wouldn't impact your provider as much financially. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last question that I have in my queue, and we appreciate all of you attending today. Let me remind you that the SHIP coordinator does need to hear your thoughts on this session to help determine its effectiveness and whether to continue this type of training. So please answer the session evaluation as quickly as possible. It will arrive in your inbox within the hour. And I would like to also remind you that we are able to offer AHIMA CEU credit for successfully completing the post-conference test which will appear in your browser window at the completion of your session evaluation. Okay, so if you have any additional questions that perhaps we didn't get to, or maybe you're typing as I'm talking and saying goodbye, you could reply to our emails and we will address those questions. Or you can phone AQIQ at 877-976-6677. I thank you once again for attending, and please complete that conference evaluation right away. The test will show up for those of you who would like to complete it as soon as you finish that conference evaluation. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.